Hi there, I'm sure you've seen this paper make the rounds. It's called MLP Mixer, an all MLP architecture for vision. It's by Ilya Tolstikin, Neil Halsby, Alexander Kolesnikov, and Lucas Beyer of Google Research. This is not going to be a long video because the concept is pretty simple. Um, these people, did I say others or just the four names? I don't remember. There are a lot of authors here. All of them deserve credit. This paper presents a neural network that is just MLP, so just feet forward multi-layer perceptrons. No convolutions, no attention mechanism, it's just matrix multiplications, non-linearities, normalization, and I think skip connections. But that's not really a layer, is it? Um, so it appears we've come full circle in computer vision, going from MLPs originally to convolutional neural networks, some pixel RNNs, then vision transformers. And by the way, this paper is going to be much more understandable if you've read the paper on vision transformers, uh, because it's from largely the same people and does the same kind of experiments and methodologies. And now we've come back to MLPs. Turns out the thing you've tried at the very beginning, you know, it works after all. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm kidding. So it's not just as simple as slap an MLP onto the problem and that works. There is a, still a very specific architecture involved right here. Um, and also, I think the paper is mostly a lesson in what you can do with scale and that good architectures might be good for a particular scale and not just good by themselves. So the end result here is going to be that this new architecture that the MLP mixer architecture performs adequately, not state of the art, not the best, but adequately at large scales. And it appears to benefit much more from scaling up than previous architectures, which raises the question, you know, what happens if we go to even larger scales, but I guess that's for another day or year or decade. So let's just dive in. Uh, this is the, the architecture, the computer vision architecture that is proposed. It's a classification architecture. You see this right here. Uh, at the end, there is like a fully connected uh, layer and a class label. And also there is a global average pooling. So at the end, you just collect everything you've done and you put it into a classifier and that gives you a class label. So that means it's amenable to uh, fine tuning where you freeze the, the representations that come out of the model and all of this, this kind of stuff that you might already know. At the beginning of the model, you have a picture. And like in Vision Transformer, you're going to divide that picture up into patches. So in this case, you take something like 16 by 16 pixels as a patch, and those become your patches down here. And now you simply operate on those patches as you propagate through the network. So unlike a convolutional neural network, where you sort of shrink the resolution, but increase the channels here, we're just going to have one layer after another, one layer as big as the last one, uh, stack, 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 and until the end. So it is much like a transformer. Of course, the difference between this and the transformer is in how the individual layer looks. So like in the transformer, first of all, every patch is fed through a fully connected layer to bring it into a latent representation. So this right here, these right here, are the latent representations. They're of a size that you choose as a model builder. And that's going to be kind of the latent size that propagates through the network. So this is done on a per patch basis. <clears throat> and this per patch operations, and, uh, you know, uh, in general, these, these sort of repeated operations are going to be the key to this architecture right here. So every patch is projected using the same uh, function into the latent space. Okay. Then we, this is followed by N of these mixer layers. Now, what does a mixer layer do? And here is where the core comes in. So in every 
layer you start out with you know you've just seen here we we had patches but now we have these latent embeddings like this stuff right here right this essentially is one vector for every patch so every patch you unroll the patches like so and every patch gets you one vector right every patch in the image corresponds to one vector so technically this here you can interpret this as a table. So that's what they do here. Well, it's just the other way around, right? So this, this here is the lower left corner. This one is the patch right next to it. This one is the patch right next to that patch and so on. And each patch has one, two, three, four, and so on channels. Okay, each patch is described by a vector of whatever, how many dimensions, I guess something like 512. And now, if you traditionally, if you solve this problem and you said, well, I have an all MLP, an all MLP uh, architecture for vision, what you would do is you would take that table and completely unroll it into one vector, right? So the, the top patch would then be here. And then the, the blue patch would be next to it right this this blue patch right here and so on so you would completely unroll that that's the yellow patch into one single vector and then you would put a fully connected layer on top of that that's not what we do here we're doing much more like what we would do in a convolution except that we only have filters of size one by one so there are two different um two different, in this mixer layer, there are two different, how should I say this, um, modes of operation. First, we do the following. We flip this table, we transpose this table. And um, so that means every row here is the same channel from all the patches. So it's always channel one from all the patches in the image, right? So from all the patches, I want channel one, and I'm gonna feed that through a fully connected layer. <clears throat> I also take all the patches, but channel two, so channel two from all the patches, I'm going to feed that through the same fully connected layer. In fact, you can see these weights are all shared right here. So this is weight sharing across different channels, so, sorry, across always across the same channel of the different patches. This is much like, you know, one by one convolution. So uh, actually, this one here is more like a one by one convolution, but it is weight sharing. Okay. And that means we have a picture, we put it into patches. And in this layer, what we care about is connecting the same channel. How? Oh not even sure how to represent the same channel. I guess you can say you, you want the same type of information since this, this all builds on the weight sharing of the last layer, right? So this fully connected layer right here, it's the same for every patch. So that fully collect connected layer might look at the patch and if there is something like a sharp corner in the top left, uh, corner of that patch, it might put that into channel one. So now all of the patches that have that in the top left corner, like some sharp corner here, will have that in their first channel. Okay. So now if I aggregate among the same channels, if I do this, then if the first channel here reacts um, across the patches, you know, I can aggregate all the patches that have that feature, um, because the feature producing map was shared. Okay, so all of this builds on the fact that in the last layer features were shared too. So here, we share the projection, which means that the channels in the individual patches mean similar things, okay, because they come from the same function. And since they mean similar things, we now group by those channels and aggregate or, or compute over all the patches in that particular channel. And since that particular channel has the same information, you know, that sort of lets us compute 
on a on a feature by feature basis. Now, also, of course, these weights are shared. So um, since these weights are shared, that means sort of on a meta level that now I'm going to perform the same computation in all of those channels, which means that now I can I can do the, the reverse trick again and flip the table back into patches and then do this shared computation for all the patches. So ultimately, I just have number one, one weight matrix where I forward propagate all of the channels individually, but in the same way. And here I have another one. So that's number two, I have one forward propagation matrix where I propagate all of the patches individually, but in the same way, right. And again, um, since I now have done the same computation over here, that means that the result here is going to be sort of distributed in the same way across patches. Now I aggregate this into the patch location. And I forward propagate this, this is much more like a one by one convolution, right? So we simply take a patch, and we apply a computation across all of the channels of that patch. And we apply the same computation and that prepares the exact same thing for the next layer. I hope that makes a little bit of sense. I have trouble articulating this, but it, it does make sense when you think about it. <laughs> so it, it there's two phases, it, you repeat, um, you look, you repeat two steps. In this step, you look at your patch and you say what kind of features are there, right? And you put the features into predefined categories. So channel one is, you know, feature one channel two for feature two and so on. And then in this step, you take uh, a look across all of the image. So step or step two is here within the patch. And step one is actually you look at all of the image, but only in that channel, that means only for that particular feature, right. And then you look, okay, where in all the picture is that particular feature, you do some computation across where that feature appears and how, and then you go back to step number one or two, however, I labeled it here. I hope that helps a bit. The MLP uh, is not really I didn't really say this correctly, you don't have one matrix. In fact, it's two fully connected layers that are separated by a nonlinearity. Um, however, this Yeah, it, it's not one weight matrix, it's it's two weight matrices, they are shared though, They're across channels or across patches depending on the step. And that's it. Um, that's the architecture there is, as you can see layer norm, you also saw this here in the diagram, there's always the, the layer norm layer uh, involved here. Is this yep, and here. And there are skip connections, as you can see at the top. But largely, that's the architecture. So what does this give us? If again, if you've seen the vision transformer paper, this is or the big transfer paper, all of this is extremely similar in terms of architectures. Uh, what they do is they build a bunch of different uh, sized models with different uh, patch resolutions. So this, you know, see the resolution is always the number after the slash, right? So here, this would be 16 by 16. So obviously, the lower this number, the higher the the resolution where the the higher the resolution in which the model looks at the picture, right? <clears throat> now, one advantage here is that uh, compared to, for example, vision transformers, is that vision transformers, of course, due to the attention mechanism, they have a quadratic requirement of, of compute and memory, as they go as they increase the sequence length, which means as they lower this number right here, um, their number of patches in the image increases, and therefore, they suffer quadratically, while this model only suffers linearly from this. And that is the point they make here in the experiments. So the experiments is it's sort of a repeating pattern. And the repeating pattern is, you know, 
if you look at the best models and let's say ImageNet top one or, or very good models, we're not quite as good, right? If, you know, depending on, so they pre-train, they pre-train on large data sets and then they transfer learn or they uh, linearly classify the frozen features and the story is always the same it's yeah you look at us we are sometimes you know even better than this but we're not we're not quite as good as this uh, however we are competitive right that's the, the 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 core message here is that we are competitive you know competitive if if this had been on the market a couple of years ago, this would have been state of the art by far. Um, but now, the this model is it's competitive. It achieves okay performance, and since that's not what we like to hear in machine learning publishing, uh, I think that the big lesson, if you want to publish something here, is that find a metric where you win. Okay, so they say, <clears throat> you know, we might not be the best ones in classification accuracy. However, we're okay and we have a better trade-off. So there are a number of trade-offs they look at right here. For example, throughput, you see this right here. Throughput images per second per core during inference. This is something that's really important to practitioners, to people that actually have to deploy these models, right? And you can see that the throughput of Mixer here is way above these other models, of course, uh, because, you know, convolutions here, they're, you know, they're a difficult operation. And also this, this big transfer model, it has a lot more layers, uh, I think, than the the, the mixer or vision transformer. And of course the vision transformer itself has that attention mechanism. So not only does it have that quadratic requirement, it also has the, the sort of computation of the soft max itself and so on. And also uh, if you look at how much you had to put into training, um, in this case, vision transformer is actually outperforming mixer. Uh, but in all of these tables, you always have at least one metric where Mixer is better. You just have to select the metric. So for example, um, you, you can see that, well, this, I like this more. <laughs> so here it's linear five shot image net top one. So uh, if I understand this correctly, this is you train a linear classifier on the frozen representation of what the model gives you. You evaluate it on top one accuracy, but you get, um, it's, a, it's a five shot classifier, okay? So that it's a very particular task and they look at what happens if we modify the training set size. So the size that we train on and you can see that in this framing, this model scales much more favorably than other models. So big transfer, which is good at, you know, low data set size, all of a sudden plateaus and doesn't increase any more or much more uh, when you scale up the data set by a significant factor. However, the mixer model scales really well and in fact at the end is on par almost sometimes with the vision transformer even here it's even a bit higher right and specifically it's also higher than the big transfer model what you can also see is that there is a significant gap at small training data sets however that gap also here that gap always appears to close as you go up. So the gap here and here and here is way smaller. And as we already said at the end, very often they are on top of one another. Now this raises a bunch of interesting questions. This is, by the way, it's not only this task, right? They show this on a bunch of tasks um, that it's the, this model benefits from scale a lot more. Um, it is, it has a, has a higher throughput, it's a simpler architecture. Um, yeah, it scales in terms of what you need to put in as compute into pre-training. And yeah, so here you can see the ImageNet transfer accuracy 
compared to how many core days on a TPU V3 you put in. And you can see that the mixer and the transformer models, they lie on very much similar curves, leading, actually, leading the uh, big transfer model. So they are computationally more efficient. And also here, in terms of throughput, you can see that um, for a given accuracy, right, mixer and transformer have higher throughputs than big transfer. And for a given size of model, uh, mixer has a higher throughput than vision transformer, though vision transformer makes up for that by being more accurate. They have very, very extensive evaluations to show that they are, you know, that this model is something, I believe this model is something that if you really care about deploying it to large scales, you might want to take that performance hit, right? Uh, in, you know, to trade off for better throughput. I think that's, that's fairly clear from these evaluations. Now, it remains to be seen how this model performs in different settings for different data for different tasks and so on. And when this is ImageNet and ImageNet after pre training with particular data sets. So here, they pre train on ImageNet itself. And you know, if you pre train on a small data set the the model sucks, right, it really trails, it really trails other models, you can see right here, if you pre train on a slightly larger data set, it still sucks, but it doesn't suck as much compared to others. If you pre train on a really big data set, you can see that it only sucks a little, <laughs> a little bit. Um, so you you're hard pressed to find a number here that's higher. And that's I think the point they make. Now the interesting question for me is, is this like, how does this go on? As we go higher, like as we go one order of magnitude higher in our data set and compute and so on. Is it the case that the mixer uh, continues rising while the vision transformer sort of plateaus out, which would be really interesting because you could you could then make the case that the vision transformer actually has more inductive biases than the um, the mixer because both seem very general, right? And I would personally argue that the vision transformer is more general and has less inductive biases because here the mixer, first of all, the weights are fixed. And second of all, there's this very particular chessboard pattern to how you interact with the input data, right? It almost seems like um, there are lots of biases here. Now, these things, these, this inductive bias might be just super duper duper correct for the particular modality we're dealing with, like Im natural image classification. Uh, or it might actually be that the mixer transfers to other domains and um, works really well, in which case I might be wrong. It also might be the case, of course, that both uh, plateau in which case that would just mean uh, with enough scale, you can get pretty much anything to work, <laughs> right? Um, so, you know, if you're cynic, you can say, well, the, even a crap architecture like mixture, uh, you can get to work by just scaling it up and using SGD and uh, yeah, which might also be true. Ultimately in the limit of scale, as you have the entire possibility of all images as your data set, you can of course just perform a K nearest neighbor classification and you'd be uh, correct 100% of the time. I don't think we're there yet with the scale, but the, the sort of trend is relatively clear, but it will be really interesting to see how that goes on after, you know, after our current limits. The last thing they show here is the the weights. And uh, so they make a, a couple of interesting, let's say, um, interesting observations here. These are the token mixing weights. So every point here corresponds to sort of one uh, patch 
in the original image. So th this is how do you aggregate information within the same channel across different patches, right? And they make some observations, namely, for example, that the weights here appear, for example, in pairs of negative positive. So blue and red here are, are uh, high and low values. Um, also, in the lower layer, so if I'm correct, this is the, the first, the second and the third uh, block. So this, this is the lower layer uh, down here and the high layer is here. You can see that in the lower layer, you have rather large scale general features that are learned, while as, as you go higher, you have much more specific interaction, specific uh, weights that you learn. And this all is very reminiscent, let's say, of how we think or how we observe convolutional neural networks uh, work. So it's a good case here that the model learns something that it is that is sensible. You can watch all of these weights. I think they have it in the appendix. They have um, the full weights right here, also pre-trained on different data sets. And, and this is really interesting too. So if you pre-train on ImageNet, it looks qualitatively different than if you pre-train on ImageNet 21K, which is just, it's, a, it's, a, it's larger with more classes. And that's also significantly different than if you pre-train on this JFT 300M, which is a super huge data set that's proprietary held by Google. Um, and it's still, I think that it's still unclear whether these differences are an effect of scale or an effect of how 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 accurate the downstream model is. So like, let's say an effect of um, how well, how much signal there is to learn independent of scale, or whether it is actually just a property of the data sets being of a different nature. And that would also explain why ImageNet and ImageNet 21K are seem to be a bit closer together visually than JFT 300M. No, don't forget that JFT is a huge data set. The code is open source. In fact, it's right here. Uh, <laughs> you can just take it. Also, I've seen already a bunch of people implement this. So this was it for me for this paper. Again, this is not, it's not very complicated. Uh, it's, a, it's a very simple architecture, which is exactly its selling point. Its selling point is it's simple. And that means it can scale up really well. It's trade off between compute and accuracy is really good. And you should consider it if that's something that's of importance to you. From a research perspective, it raises a lot of questions about inductive biases, how scale behaves and whether you can get anything and everything to work with SGD and a lot of TPUs. That's it. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.